Well, hello, my name is Paul Manti, and I'm the uh, Virtualization Program Manager for the Americas uh, Business Critical Servers. And uh, I'm here to talk about the HP's Virtual Server Environment Partitioning Continuum. And mostly what I want to show you is, is how to chalk talk this with your customers, how to walk them through what the various offerings are within our virtual server environment from a partitioning continuum perspective. So if we look at this slide, I think everyone's very familiar with this slide. We have here hardware partitioning and software partitioning as, as a, a key element among the entire virtual server environment. And what I'm going to try and convey during this, during this, uh, this chalk talk is the fact that all of this stuff has been integrated by design to work with one another. So that's really the key point out of this entire presentation is that we've taken the virtual server environment and we've integrated all the various pieces, all the various components, all the various products together in order to um, help speed application time to market, help reduce customer risk, and help them better align IT to the business. So when we look at the virtual server environment partitioning continuum, the best way to think of it is, is that it's a continuum here. With over here on the left, you have isolation. And over here on the right, we have flexibility. Now, this is not to say that isolation is better than flexibility or, or flexibility is better than isolation. It's to say that whether you're looking for a solution that provides best isolation or a solution that fly, so applies best flexibility, you can find it in our virtualization partitioning continuum. So over here on the left, we have clusters. Uh, if there's any open VMS people in the room? No. So an open VMS person will tell you that on June 18th, 1982, they invested, invented clustering. So, yeah, I, I see the... I'm actually in HPUX land right here, and I'm getting some interesting looks. So what the whole idea was that we, we divide the workload among you know, various systems, and then if one of the particular systems goes down, the other systems pick up the workload. You know, this is something we do quite a, a bit today. I think the most favorite configuration is to do some sort of a, a failover with Service Guard. And Service Guard, as we know, is the HPUX product that we've been shipping since 1995. 1994? Yeah, so we've been shipping it forever. Not quite since 1982, but getting close. And we have hundreds of thousands of customers that are doing this. This is also kind of enjoying a little bit of in vogue as, uh, as you know, Oracle talks about scaling out, and we're going to talk about that as we move on. Looking at the next section here on the partitioning continuum, we have NPARs which were invented when we brought out the Superdome in the year 2000. And the way to consider NPARs and to think about NPARs is that it's electrical isolation. And it is multi-OS. So the integrity systems, as you know, support HPUX, Windows, Linux, OpenVMS. The cool thing about NPARs is that you can run all of those as separate servers inside the same box, whether it's an RX8640, an RX 80, uh, 7640, uh, Superdome, or something like that. And so what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you how NPARs are actually constructed. So like all computers, you need to have some sort of a processing power, right? So these are processors. Some amount of memory, and then a link down here to I.O. out the box. This is the fundamental unit of computing in a Superdome. It's a cell. So I got CPUs, memory, and I got I.O. This I.O. has got a very high-speed link back here that really gives us a, a, a tremendous advantage in terms of our perf competitive performance because of how much I.O. we can traffic through this. Now, in an RX 7640, you build an RX 7640 with two of these cells. Okay? Now, here's the cool secret sauce of scalable computing. What we can do is we can link them together with what's called a crossbar link that's got very, very high bandwidth, something on the order of 27 gigabytes per second. And I want to make a very important distinguish to you. We're talking about sustainable bandwidth through that crossbar. Is everyone familiar with the difference between peak and sustained? So peak bandwidth is they took the number of bits, they multiplied it by how fast they're twiddling, and they came up with a number and they quoted to that. I, I call that the marketing number. And I'm looking at a bunch of marketers here right now, and they're all glaring at me. The sustain number means that a propeller head in the lab got in and measured with the system under load how fast traffic was traveling between those two cells. And they find 
that they can do 27 gigabytes per second of sustainable throughput. Now, this is on a system that's already been shipping for two years. We're going to have systems out next year that's even faster than this. But the other key number here to remember is 450 nanoseconds. So if you have a requesting process over here, and the information it wants is over here in this processor on this other cell, no matter where that cell is in the system, whether it's one crossbar hop or two crossbar hops away, it'll never take longer than 450 nanoseconds for that information to come back. Now, why, Paul, are you getting all speedsy-feedsy on me? Well, when you, look at, when you look at scale out and all the arguments about how wonderful scale out is, you have to look at the physical layer that this is all running through. And so if these were two scalable nodes, they'd be running through gigabit Ethernet, right? And if you look at gigabit Ethernet, that's actually their peak bandwidth. So sustainable bandwidth through a gigabit Ethernet channel is about 100 megabytes per second. So compare the number 100 million with 27 billion, and you start to get an idea of how much faster, how much more bandwidth there is on the crossbar versus, say, gigabit Ethernet. Even 10 gig Ethernet is only going to be approximately 10 times more, maybe, you know, maybe on the order of a, of a billion. So it's still 27 times more than even 10 gig Ethernet. And then if you start looking at the delay and including things like the protocol layer, the TCP IP protocol layer, now we're starting to talk about two milliseconds or more for traffic to get from one place to another. So this is why scalable computing is so important. Now, I brought this up in the, con in the construct of talking about NPAR. So why did I go into that? Well, I find that I get a lot of arguments that the performance is just as good. Let's make sure they all understand what the latency is of doing a scale-up system versus a scale-up. And in some cases, it's OK. And it's going to work just fine. And in other cases, that's why you need the HP integrity boxes. Now, the other reason I brought up NPARs of this crossbar is that when we do to NPAR, we actually break this, right? It's broken here. It is an auditable break between the two so that any information that resides here cannot possibly get to here uh, unless it ran out through I.O. that connected the two together. So this crossbar is literally broken. That is the first meaning of electrical isolation. There's no way for information to get from here to here through this crossbar. Not only has it been broken, but the registers that allowed access get massed out of the space, and they can't even be accessed. So in NPAR, then, the other meaning of electrical isolation is I could run HPUX over here, and I could run Windows over here, and the two operating devices, the two servers, wouldn't even know that the other existed. So if I needed to do maintenance, let's say I needed to add memory or add CPU or do something over here to this Windows that requires a reset, a reboot, a physical removal of the cell, then this one over here, this cell, will just keep right on running. So this environment will just keep right on running. So those are the two key aspects of electrical isolation. Now, if you go and buy 11i v3, which we've now been shipping for, what, a year and a half? We can now take in this HPUX world, and we could, we could decide, you know what? We don't need this Windows image anymore over here. So let's go ahead and shut it down. We'll remove the Windows from it. We'll make it HPUX. When we turn it back up, we can tell the system, please add it to this, cap this system over here. And it can add these resources on the fly to this HPUX image without ever doing a reboot. That's pretty cool functionality and features when you think about it from a, um, a serviceability and availability kind of um, uh, perspective. So that's what NPARS is. So everyone sees that. It's multi-OS. I could run Windows. I could run an HPUX instance next to it, a VMS or a Linux next to it, all in the same box. OK, so the next technology that I want to talk about as we move further and further over in the flexibility realm is VPARS. VPARS has also been shipping since 2000, which is apparently was a banner year for us bringing uh, virtualization products out. And I know that would be eight years ago. This is software isolation. And it's HPUX only. This is what all the other software partitioning technologies wish they could be when they grow up. Okay? Now, why do, why do I make that kind of claim? Well, the latency, latency, bandwidth, and CPU overhead are three key factors when you're doing virtualization. So these have got the lowest numbers in the industry in terms of CPU overhead.